All right, Santa girl. Want you to forget about all your troubles in your life. We received the power. right now, it ain't about you. We give you all of the glory right now. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you. Why y'all? For you're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Together, together, together. That's why we worship you. We worship you. Oh, I need some believers up in here, sir. Come on. We worship the you yeah. in this house. I, I need a witness. In the sanctuary, a living we receive give you all give the glory. You all the glory. We give you all of the glory yeah. right now. Do I have any true believers up in here? We honor you. Just wave it. You're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Oh, that's why we worship you. You don't have to be older, praise him. Come on, young folk. I got some young folks up in here. I know that the hour We have put together some suggestions for you that we believe will help you to get the most out of your worship experience. Listen to these 10 suggestions and attempt to implement them in your home as you transform your home into your sanctuary. Be on time. Worship service starts at 10.15. Sing along with the song leader. Stand when taking communion. Bow your head during prayers and pray along with the prayer leader. Take off your PJs. Dress reverently. Clothes affect how we feel and how we behave. Have your Bible open during the sermon. Put everything aside and focus on the worship. Worship along with family members and not all on separate devices. Pay attention to your environment and reduce any distractions. Prepare for service by preparing your mind with prayer, meditation, or religious music. O rock eternal and everlasting God, we dwell upon an earth that you made and walk in the dust from which you made us. How great are your works, O Lord. And though your face is hidden from us, we know that you hide in plain sight in the works of your hands magnificent to behold and wonderful to consider. We thank you for the life that you breathe into man, but especially for the life in us today that you sustain by your power, grace, and mercy. You have given mankind the skill to build the great cities of this world, Rome, Paris, Tokyo, and Houston. But we are sorrowful, just as you are, that our great cities are also great places of wickedness, Lord, give us, your children, the power, courage, and love to bring your holy city into the wicked cities of men, and with your help, bring about a holy renewal, not of brick and mortar, but of hearts and faith. Father, block our path when we run to sinful pleasures, and keep our feet on the path of holiness. Where we need help, help us, Lord. Where we need blessings, bless us. Where we need healing, heal us. And when the cares of the world blind us, make us see your bright glory and always give us hearts and minds to serve. We thank you for sending your son to our earthly cities and prospering your kingdom on earth so that today we may pray to you through him. Amen.
We now come to a part of our worship service, the communion, where we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We find scriptural example in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, where it reads, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. For as often as ye eat the bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse number 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread together. Most holy and honorable Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you gave your only begotten Son to die for our sins. Forgive us of all of our sins by word, thought, or deed so that we may take this bread that represents your son's broken body on the cross with a clean hands and a pure heart. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may now take the bread. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the cup together. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his willingness to die for, the for our sins and him taking our place on the cross of Calvary. We take this cup that represents your son's shed blood, for without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take the cup. We want to instruct you on how you can give your tithes and offering online. You simply go to the official Pearland West Church of Christ homepage at pearlandwestcoc.org and in the upper left at the top of the page you will see online giving. You simply click that link and it takes you to our online giving page. Under choose a fund, click general giving, the amount you would like to contribute, and the option to include a memo and the frequency of how you would like your contribution to be. You then click no thanks and click on the con contribute button. This takes you to the PayPal page where you enter an email or a mobile number. You also have the option to contribute via a debit or credit card, after which you click next and your contribution is entered. You will also notice a QR code in the middle of the screen or in the right corner of the screen right now. And you can use the camera of your smartphone to capture that QR code and it would take you directly to the online giving page and you can follow the exact same instructions that I just gave. Thank you, church family, and God bless. We now come to a part of our service, which is contribution. We find recorded in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, starting at verse 6, and it reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Let us pray for the contribution. Kind Master, we come to you giving you all thanks, honor, and glory, and praise. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to give back that of which you have given us a small portion. Father, we pray for the Pearland West uh, congregation that we use it in a timely and fashionable way for the upbuilding of your kingdom. This is our prayer in your son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Let us all say amen. Sometimes I him feeling his heart's with fear. Freedom we all hope dear. 
Now is that stay and humble your heart to God. Say some the test and name on. Seek the way pilgrims from shot Christians away. Oh, and my Jesus is coming. Yeah. 
Welcome to the worship experience here at the Pearland West Church of Christ. We are so grateful God has allowed us to assemble together again, even within the context of this virtual or digital format. We're thankful. We worship and we come together spiritually, even if physically we're not in the same place. Spiritually, we're all gathered together right here, right now. And we're in the same place as it relates to God. We want to continue praying for those, as I said last week, who are working through grief. 
come alongside, remind them that they are not alone. We also want to continue praying for those who are battling through illnesses, and we want to celebrate with those who are coming to the point of recovery. We're thankful to God for all that he does. Let us always remember that whatever state we are in, therewith to learn to be content and to trust God is walking with us on our individual journeys. I'm going to ask that you continue looking for the target date of January 16th. We're almost there, seven weeks away. Let's start our countdown, seven weeks from being back together again. We're targeting that date. Make certain that you have it on your calendar. Take your Bibles out, take out your pen, take out your pad. Let's continue looking at this theme of sharpening our vision. We've just finished talking about living for the city. Well, if we have the spiritual city embedded within the earthly city, what is the state or condition of the population that is in the spiritual city? That's what we want to talk about starting this morning. We want to talk about building a sense of community, building a sense of community. And we're going to do that by launching our thinking from Isaiah 56, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Come go there with me right now. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain. I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its wall a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. We're going to continue looking at the theme of sharpening our vision. We're going to look back at the last chapters of Isaiah and the vision of Pearland West Church of Christ. The vision of Pearland West is what is our purpose? Why are we here in Pearland? What exactly is it that we are trying to do? What exactly are we seeking to accomplish? The vision of Pearland West is to build a great city for all people through a gospel movement that brings personal conversion, that brings community formation, that brings social justice, and it brings cultural renewal to Pearland, to Houston, and through Houston, ultimately to the entire world. Now today, 
we're going to be looking at why it is so vitally important for us to form community, for us to build community. This passage, Isaiah chapter 56, will tell us about the importance of community. It will tell us about the patterns of life inside that unique community, and it will tell us about the power to create that community. Let's start looking at that. We won't finish this this morning, but we will lay the groundwork and we will build on this throughout the entire month. Let's start off looking at the importance of community. Look at verse number one again with me. This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Now, what I want to do is zoom in on the first part of verse number one, where the Bible says, this is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand. Now, in chapters 54 through 55, all of the chapter's emphases has been God's unconditional salvation. You cannot merit your salvation. You cannot earn your salvation. It is free. Isaiah 55 talks about the fact that God's salvation is without cost to us. It's free. It can't be merited. Now we go to Isaiah chapter 56 and verse number one, and it says, maintain justice, do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand. The theme of this verse reminds me of that immortal poem that all of us are familiar with, especially this time of the year. You'd better watch out. You'd better not cry. You'd better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. He's going to find out whether you're naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming. It certainly looks like he's saying, you'd better live this good life if you want to be saved. That seems to contradict everything else in the Bible. So maybe there's another way to read the text. And there is. The word salvation here is vitally important. We have to look at what the Bible says about salvation. And especially about the fact that salvation itself has a history. There is a history to this word salvation. Go back to the beginning of the Bible. And we're told that God made the human race for three purposes primarily. First of all, to build our lives and to center our lives to serve God. Secondly, to live in loving community with one another. Thirdly, to care for this created world that God has gifted to us. But as we pointed out pretty much each week since we've been looking at this particular theme, the Bible tells us that the human race has always opted to not build their lives around God, but rather humanity repeatedly opts to try to keep control of their own lives. They try to keep control of their own destiny. We try to keep control of our own lives. When our relationship with God unraveled, all other relationships unraveled. So relationships between nations, and unfortunately in America's case, relationships within the nation are now characterized by all sorts of strife, characterized by all sorts of expressions of violence, characterized by war. Relationships between classes, 
relationships between races characterized by strife, characterized by conflict, characterized by violence. Even the most basic relationships, even relationships that are not across the cultural divides, even relationships within the family context, family relationships are challenged by our thinking more about ourselves and lose sight of the bigger picture because of the fact that we are all caught up in our own feelings. We're all caught up in our own personal preferences. And you even have family members who will smile in your face, but it's all a charade. It's all a facade. Friendships. You have friendships that, that, that are not real friendships. You've noticed it. I'm certain. Friendships that are always blowing up. Friendships that are, unless you work incredibly hard at these friendships by not always being your true self, by not always saying what you genuinely believe, by keeping a lot of your thoughts to yourself. In essence, you deciding in order for me to be friends with you, I will not be me. I will not be my true self. And you walk around on eggshells. And even if you do work incredibly hard to try to preserve and maintain these friendships, they're still blowing up. You have to resist the temptation of falling into a level of comfort with pseudo community. Pseudo community. Somebody says, well, Brotherly, what is pseudo-community? Pseudo-community is false community. Pseudo-community is fake community, which is really not community at all. There's a tendency to become comfortable with pseudo-community. When you get comfortable with pseudo-community, you actually allow yourself to get comfortable with pretending. You like to pretend when you get closer to anybody in a community, the longer you're together, the closer and more intimate you're going to become. And as you get closer to one another, it's inevitable there's going to be conflict. But instead of doing the work of working through your conflict, instead of doing the work of working through your issues instead of doing the work of trying to find a place of resolve. What you do is think about yourself and then you retreat back to pseudo community and a pseudo community relationship. Consequently, genuine relationship is compromised. You never arrive to true community because it's uncomfortable for you. You are only concerned about you. You place more value on you and your feelings. What's going on? Let me tell you what's going on. The answer is you can only have a solar system if there's one center. Listen to me carefully. You can only have a solar system if there is one center. If every planet wants to be the center, you won't have a solar system. You'll end up with a solar collision in a world in which everyone is self-absorbed, in a world in which everyone is thinking about me and my needs. In a world in which everyone is thinking about my preferences and what I want. In a world in which everyone is self-centered, human community, which is really what we desperately want, is no more than a lost dream. Well, what about passive personalities, Brother Lee? Uh, we deal with passive personalities that's not the same thing as self-centeredness, is it? What about the person who harbors 
ill feelings? What about the person who quietly walks around with an antagonistic spirit? What about the person that walks around with subtle hostilities? What about the person that walks around with cloaked anger? What about the person who walks around with subtle frustration, but takes pride in the fact of saying, well, you know, I don't ever start anything. Pseudo community. You're allowing yourself to be satisfied with pseudo community, false community, fake community. Sure, there are people who let other people walk on them and other people who allow uh, the general public to exploit them. And you have people who allow themselves to be pushed around and, and you say absolutely nothing and take pride in saying absolutely nothing. And you know exactly who you are, but think about it. When you really, really think about it, why do you do that? Why is it that you conceal those feelings and say nothing about it and take pride in being able to say, well, I don't ever say anything about it. Well, what causes you to do that? Why do you make that choice? Isn't it fear? Isn't it cowardice? Isn't it in some cases your need to be needed or your need to be accepted? Well, that's still selfishness and that is still self-absorption that is still ruining human community. But God comes along and God has an answer for us. God has a resolve. God was never content to leave humanity to themselves. When you look at what the Bible says, first of all, God comes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses one through five. I want you to come go there with me. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now listen to what God is actually saying here. In essence, God is telling Abram, I want to make your family into a new reconstituted human community. I want to create a new humanity, a new community of peace, of justice, of love, and I'm going to do it out of your family. In order to do that, God had to come and God had to intervene into time and into space. And he had to bring a baby out of a 90 year old woman, Sarah, Look at Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 through 19. And God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him 
as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now, do you understand what God is making clear to us here? God is making clear that he had to intervene into time and into space. Then a couple of centuries later, we have Moses at Mount Sinai. God comes down to intervene in time and space again. And he says to Moses, in essence, I want to make you not just simply a family, but a whole nation. I want to make you an entire society. I want to create a reconstituted human community, a new humanity of peace, a new humanity of justice, a new humanity of love. In order to accomplish that end, God had to come and intervene again in time and in space. He had to come down in a much grander way, a greater way, because he had to liberate them from slavery in Egyptian bondage and to bring them to Canaan in Exodus chapter 3. Now we come to Isaiah chapter 40, all the way through, as we have been seeing, pointing forward to another intervention another intervention in time and in space. God says a greater Moses is coming. A greater Moses is coming who is going to bring about a greater liberation. Jesus Christ, who on the cross is not simply going to be liberating us from political and social oppression, but Jesus Christ is going to come and liberate us from sin and liberate us from death itself. That is the greatest intervention to date to which God himself comes down in the form of a human being in the form of Jesus Christ, and he dies and he rises. Then in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus turns around and he looks at his disciples in Matthew 5, 14. We've already talked about this. He looks at his disciples and he says to them, you are a city up on a hill. You are a reconstituted human community. You are a new community of peace. You are a new community of love. You are a new community of justice that God is creating in the world. Now it's no longer just a family. In fact, it's not even one nation or one ethnic group, but now all peoples who are incorporated into my new community can be a part of that community. And it's not just one land, but it's all lands. You are an alternate city. You are alt.city.org in every city. Finally, history's salvation is done because when you get to the end of Isaiah chapter 65, 17 through 25, I want you to go there. We want to close out this morning with this particular text. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. God says this. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. 
No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. That is a beautiful text. God says through the prophet Isaiah, Behold, I will create a new heaven, and I will create a new earth. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat with the ox. They will neither harm nor destroy any on my holy mountain, saith the Lord. What is he teaching us here? He's teaching us that all of the relationships are bad. The future absolute human community, absolute human community harmony between us and the created world. Every relationship, instead of being frayed, every relationship, instead of being broken, is brought back together again. This is the salvation which is to come. Do you see the history of what is happening here? God comes down into time and into space, and he does it in stages, each time more radically with his saving interventions. And every time he comes down even more radically, and therefore the recipients of his grace are more transformed. The community that they are a part of is also re constituted in a more extensive way and in a more radical way. Now, what is Isaiah 56 and verse 1 really saying? Go back and look at it with me again as we wrap this up. This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Listen to that verse, maintain justice and righteousness, maintain justice and righteousness. This is all about relationship. Justice and righteousness have to do with relationship. The whole passage is about being a people in community. We're going to stop right here. We'll pick this up again on next Lord's Day. I pray that you'll be with us as we continue talking about building a sense of community. God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keeps me in the valley and hides me from the rain. Say, my God, my God is awesome. You know he heals me when I'm broken. He's my strength where I've been weak and wherever he will reign. Say, my God, my God is awesome. He can move mountains, keeps me in the valley and hides me from the rain. Sing it again, my God is awesome. You know he heals me when I'm broken. He's my strength where I've been weak and wherever he will reign. Say, my God, my God is awesome. Oh, oh awesome. Oh.
my God is awesome. He's the Savior of the whole world. Giver of salvation. By His stripes I am here. My God, my God is awesome. You know today I am forgiven. His grace is why I live in. Praise His holy name. Say, my God, my God is awesome. Oh, oh, oh awesome. Oh.
merciful Father, we are hungry to be filled, whole, happy, and at last we found that these worthy desires are found on the road of service. Encourage us, O Lord, to serve you by serving those whom you have made. The peoples of these earthly cities who are being consumed by evil. Lord, see us, comfort us, make us over in the image of your son. May all that we meet see Jesus and not us in all that we say and all that we do as we go about the business of living, working, and surviving in these earthly cities of men. And help us, dear Lord, to keep our eyes on the eternal city where there will be no more crying, no more hate, no more rape, sex trafficking, racism, murder, or pandemics. Holy Jesus, we lift you up so that you draw men to you, and we pray through you so that we may draw the favor of the Father. Amen.